Good morning and welcome to our online church service for our fourth Sunday after Epiphany. Uh, this is our usual recorded service and these will come to an end hopefully by the end of Easter as we switch to live streaming. So count, count down to how many that we have left here. Uh, our texts today are, sort of, are surrounding a lot of different topics. We have from Jeremiah and from the Psalms all talking about personal callings and the things that God really calls us to do to use our gifts in good ways. And then Paul talks to us about how love really enhances those gifts and really hopes that not only that early church in Corinth, but us too, to share, share with each other the love and the gifts that we hold together. And... Of course, this gospel text today is kind of a difficult one, where Jesus is run out of his own home <clears throat> after preaching in the synagogue, not understanding that he is the Messiah. Uh, just a few announcements for today. Uh, our annual meeting is February the 6th. It's immediately following church service, so at about 10 o'clock, we'll just head on down to the fellowship hall to vote or we'll stay in the sanctuary. It'll remain to be seen what we have the spacing for. Um, and also on February the 6th, during the church service, we'll be welcoming some new members so they can, you know, immediately vote right afterwards. <laughs> um, and I'd really uh, like you to ask to keep in your prayers the family of Frank Moe, and especially his wife, Sherry. There's a memorial service for him on February the 5th, uh, the Saturday before our annual meeting. From 11 till 1, you can come and visit him in Trinity. And followed, following that, there'll be a fireside service in the parking lot between the town hall and Trinity. Uh, he will be buried in Trinity Cemetery. Well, all these things we bring to you, but let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In our first reading this morning, God calls Jeremiah to be a prophet. He calls him even already in the womb. And Jeremiah's task, like any prophet's, is to preach God's word amid the difficult times of his day, political realities of his time before the people of Israel had been sent into exile in Babylon. Here's this reading from the fourth chapter of Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over the nations and over kingdoms, to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. 
second reading is this great love chapter of Paul that he writes to the church in Corinth. It follows the reading from last Sunday, which uh, told about the body and the unity of the body and all of the gifts, varying gifts of the body. This community in Corinth was very torn apart by uh, dissension as to who was the greatest and whose gifts were the best. And so Paul sums it up here in this beautiful chapter to say, uh, above it all uh, is love. Hear this reading from 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. In our gospel, people in Jesus' hometown are initially pleased when he says that God will free the oppressed. Their pleasure turns to rage when he reminds them that God's prophetic mission typically pushes beyond human boundaries, so that mercy and healing are extended to those regarded as outsiders. Our Gospel is text this morning from, from St. Luke, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Then Jesus began to say to all in the synagogue in Nazareth, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the thing that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in that prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zephrathah in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except for Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Amen. Our epistle this morning is something that many of us would find familiar. And it may stand in a bit of contrast with our gospel. The epistle is full of love, while the gospel full of rage. 
Well, many pastors have read this chapter from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, and many weddings, my own included. But this chapter goes further than its well-quoted adage, love is patient, love is kind. The love in this chapter is godly. Something that was and is one of the greatest gifts ever given. Paul wants the early church of Corinth to know this and informs us even today that there is nothing from us that matters if it doesn't come from a place of love. Lest we forget the last two weeks where Paul was telling us in 1 Corinthians 12 that people of Corinth were differing parts of the body, the body of Christ, like us. The talk of differing gifts that were united in faith. Here in chapter 13, Paul reminds them that they shouldn't focus on their gifts so much as to underestimate God's love through them. Indeed, the people of Corinth's early church had extraordinary gifts in the face of persecution of the early church, but they began believing their gifts were more important than anything else, more important than love. Paul knew this, and even by chapter 12, he writes, Eagerly desire the greater gifts, and now I will show you the more excellent way. Paul's referring to love. God's love that persists and never fails. Paul starts by giving them an example, something concrete that they can chew on. Suppose Paul himself was speaking to them, as is his gift to do so, without loving him, loving them as he does so. His words would be empty, useless words from a blowhard person telling people to come together for no real reason. But if the person, and in this case still Paul, had love towards the people they are speaking to, they would generally, Paul would be better at speaking to the things that the people care about. In this case, Paul knew that the people of Corinth cared greatly about their own faith and spoke highly of their gifts of faith. So Paul, in love, uses this, saying that their faith means nothing if they don't have love for it, or for others they share the faith with. Their faith and their gifts that the early Christian Corinthians held dear would not last if they didn't accept the love that he was talking about, the love of God. To go further than that, Paul says the prophecies, the knowledge, the speaking, and community building would all end, but the love would never fail. This chapter is starting to seem a little bit more negative and the flowery view and positive feelings than what a wedding would bring. This negative admonishing was showing that these people of the early church of Corinth, that their own gifts wouldn't last. So what's the positive? The positive then is obviously for them to last, turning it on its head. And Paul told them that God's love is the path to pers persevering gifts. Because God's love never fails. The positives of this passage are a love are so listed out. The unfailing love doesn't insist on itself or declares itself great. Instead, it persists and moves among the people. It is persevering even when humans can't keep up. And Paul says that love is just the opposite in relation to everything else ending. Knowing now that everything fails, it hopes for all times. It perseveres for all times and protects all the time. Always God's love. Paul realized that these believers, and he too, had a hard time understanding God's perfect love. And so he used another example, something that the Corinthians as a people would have had a great love for as well. Corinth was well known for its age for the manufacturing of polished bronze mirrors. That understanding, or in a way that the love had for the people of Corinth he was speaking to, led to this example, for instance. The example of that mirror as a metaphor of difficult understanding. In verse 12, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. On this side of heaven, on this side of the mirror, we can't understand God's perfect love for us. We know that God's will and love are perfect and that the Lord does all things well, but on our own side of heaven, 
our sinful nature clings to us. Like a tarnished metal mirror, we can't see ourselves in our gifts, and our gifts cannot shine through without love. At the end of our chapter, almost, draw, almost to draw the tarnish from us further, we get this from Paul. And now these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Why would Paul say the greatest of these is love? Even after all we've learned about the persistence of gods and the gifts and the mirrors, we surely have gotten the point by now. I suppose there's only one last thing to ask. What is love? And unlike the song, what is this love that is greater than faith? What is this love that is greater than hope for us? Tim Mayer, a Midwestern, a Midwestern Lutheran pastor, interprets this as a love, a peace that surpasses all understanding. At the very beginning, we heard that God is love in Genesis. That's the only way that you and I can understand love is to understand God. God shows us his love, doesn't he? A beautiful verse from Titus reads, but when the kindness and love of our God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. This verse describes Jesus, our Savior, as the love of God. That is love. That is our path to understanding God's love. Jesus, our Savior, is love, and out of love, God saved us out of death and misery. His grace and mercy saved us. And that's the answer to the tarnish on our mirror. The means to exercise our gifts and to have them last. We can live lives that are changed, changed for love among others, love even in more challenging times than we even face today. Our own love and joy reflect God's love in Christ because we live our lives not wondering what is good and right. Because we know that through God's love, a love that never fails, we will be drawn to the good and right, and try to live that way. Not only are we able to match up to the gifts that we have been given, but these gifts can work, can work to build the community that we are so drawn to be a part of as well. Paul described the love of God that is so great that God gave his only son to die for us. Only then we see the reasons for living our lives with loves, because his love never fails. We begin to see too how love became, became the greatest of all these gifts, because without the Savior, where would I, you and I be? We would be lost. We would have been condemned to eternal death. Love then really is the greatest gift that we have been given. And through the love means that we have faith. And if we have faith, we can hope for our future. Even if all of our other gifts fall away, God loves you. And that love never fails. Amen. Amen.
Receive this blessing. God, who leads you in pathways of righteousness, who rejoices over you, and who calls you by name, bless your going out and your coming in, today and forever. Amen. Amen.